The first scripture reading today is from the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory saith the Lord of hosts. The second scripture reading today is from the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. We are uh, talking about the Messiah this, um, this Advent. In a, in a week from now, our choir is going to sing parts of it for us, and I am so excited for that uh, concert next week. Uh, Handel, the composer, George Frederick Handel, did some things a little bit differently in his career. He kind of shook things up a little bit as far as you can shake things up in the Baroque era. I mean, there's still like, you know, the powdered wigs and the frilly collars and stuff, but he kind of shook things up in how composers do their work. What the typical practice was, was that a composer connected themselves to a, a benefactor, to a patron, um, which was good, because like, then they could eat. Because, uh, uh, you know, musicians, they get paid great. Uh, nothing much has changed in that regard. But, uh, so, but you connected yourself to a benefactor, which meant you either um, got employed at a court, like someone in royalty, you know, paid you and you composed music for them, or for the church. Like the Bach did that most of his career is associated with the church, and you, and you wrote for the church, which was great, but also kind of limited what you could do because you had to compose music that was within the tastes of the one who was writing your paycheck. And if you sort of drifted outside of those tastes, then you, uh, they, would, they would let you know about it. Well, Handel didn't do that exactly. He kind of drifted from project to project. He never stayed too long with one patron, which allowed him to write a bit differently. He still was very successful, had a very lucrative career financially, but he, um, he didn't, wasn't beholden to one particular patron's musical tastes. He wrote more for the people rather than for the paycheck. He, um, it, it kind of was his philosophy of how he sort of lived his life and how he wrote his music. He, even when he was writing religious music, and a lot of his music was religious, he wasn't writing so much to describe the glory of God as he was to describe the human response to God in the world. That was the observation of a conductor named Harry Bickett that Handel is writing about the human response to the divine much more than about the character of God. Not just in his writing, but in how he lived his life. In fact, he is said to have given away all the profits, uh, financial profits that, that the Messiah made. At its, at its premiere in Dublin, he donated all the profits to a debtor's prison and to a hospital. And when he was asked why he had done that, he said, because I myself have been a sick man and am now cured. Because I myself have been a prisoner and have been set free. We don't know a lot about him. We do know he was a man of faith. He, he translated across the board. So it premiered, the work premiered in Dublin and then it moved to London. And after its premiere in London, someone came up to him apparently after that premiere performance of Messiah and congratulated him on this excellent entertainment to which Handel is said to have replied, my Lord, 
I should be sorry if I only entertained them. I wish to make them better. He wrote his music to transform people, to make us better. He shook up the art form in a lot of ways, including what he did with the texts that he used. We know Messiah is texts from scripture, but we don't put them, he didn't put them in order. And here, uh, credit should be given to the librettist as well, Charles Jennings, who is the librettist for Messiah. So last week we talked about how the beginning of Messiah starts out with a prophet, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 40, comfort ye my people. And then the next little section jumps to this uh, bass solo, which uses the prophet Haggai, but only two verses of Haggai. And then it just crams the other bit with this prophet of Malachi to finish up the solo, which is the technical compositional term for doing that cram. They cram (laughs) these two different prophets together. And so when the bass soloist sings, thus saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, he's singing the first text we heard today that Elizabeth read from, from Malachi. But then when the messenger suddenly comes to the temple, that's a totally different prophet. And he didn't even like set us up for that. It's just like, okay, we're just going to use a different prophet because it says a different thing. We get that part about God shaking up the world, which Matthew's going to do a much better job of singing than I ever could. I will shake. Very shaky. Uh, And then all of a sudden, this messenger comes, and we're not talking about shaking anymore. We're talking about refining and the refinement of silver. So we put these two passages together in the worship service because Handel puts them together in Messiah. And maybe we'll kind of figure out why he did that. Let's look at each one of those and try to understand why those two things connect together so very well. Let's get to the book of Haggai, first of all. Haggai's um, a prophet who is writing after the exile is over. So last week we talked about Isaiah chapter 40, which was written while the people were in exile, and now the people have returned home, and now Haggai is at work during this season of the the history of the people. Exile was a time that lasted for an entire generation, somewhere between 50 and 70 years probably, depending on sort of when you start counting. And if it's, if it's that long that the people were exiled, deported from their home, it means that there are people who were born during exile, who had children then during exile. So these grandchildren are returning home to a place that they've never, ever seen before. And their grandparents are returning home with them to a place that they remember quite well. They remember Solomon's temple. They remember the grand architecture and the gold and the jewels and the opulence and the bedazzled worship experience that they had there in the temple. And it turns out there are also people who never left in the first place. We think about the exile as all the Jewish people being taken from Judah, but not all of them left. There were some who stayed and farmed the land and, and tried to eke out a living under the thumb of Babylon. And, and, it is, and, and here comes this group back home again. And now they have to figure out, well, hey, that was my farm. What are you doing working it now? And can I share a piece of that? And who even are we anymore? Where's our city, which is a pile of debris and rubble still? It's not like they had any resources to work with either. The reason they were able to come back home again is because Babylon got conquered by Persia. And King Cyrus of Persia wanted nothing to do with the the people of Judah. He set them free. He said, y'all going home now. Didn't help them with that, just set them free. Rather like our nation did when we emancipated the slaves, right? You're all free now. Not that we're going to help you with that by any chance. You're just, you're going to be free. So they're going back home. They have nothing, and they're trying to figure out who they are. They're trying to figure out how to rebuild their identity. Who even are we anymore? And in the midst of those questions, Haggai comes along, and he says, you know what we need to do? We need to rebuild the temple. So the prophet Haggai, his main focus is trying to get the people motivated to rebuild this temple. However, There's a big difference now, a theological difference that has a huge impact on the work of the people. They are not rebuilding this temple so that God would then be with them. They are rebuilding this temple 
because God has been and continues to be with them. You hear the distinction? They're not rebuilding this temple so that God will now show up in their midst. They know that God is with them, and so now they are responding by building this temple. You could hear it in the first chapter of Haggai. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the The Lord stirred up the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. The temple was rebuilt as a recognition that God was with them. It's the same that we do in the church. We don't do what we do as the church so that God will be with us. We don't do what we do as a church so that God will love us more. God could not love us more or less than God already does. We do what we do as the church. We metaphorically build our temple because we know that God is with us. Amen? And we are grateful for God's love and grace in our life. And so what we do is in response to that reality. That's what's going on here as well. They're rebuilding their temple because God is with them. them. But still, it's not the same. It's not Solomon's temple. They don't have the resources to restore it to how it looked in the glory days. There's still people who remember it, you remember? There's still those grandparents who's like, this is nothing. This is a pile of stones and boards. Solomon's temple, oh, it was, you should have seen it, kids. It was out of this world. You would not have believed it. This is, you know how that happens? How we have this time of a little bit ago that's always just, everything was just great. Even though, was it really? (laughs) I mean, the people seem to have forgotten that Solomon's construction of this grand and glorious temple completely bankrupted the nation and led to their division into two kingdoms, right? But oh, that temple, it was shiny. (laughs) This is nothing compared to that temple. So the date is also significant here. So we know the exact date that Haggai is uttering this prophecy. It's, it's written in the book itself. Uh, it was the 21st day of the seventh month, which puts it right in the middle of the Feast of Booths, Feast of Tabernacles, the Hebrew term Sukkoth. Sukkoth is a, is a fall, it's an autumn festival celebrating the abundance of God and God's provision. And as it turns out, the dedication ceremony of the original temple, the Temple of Solomon, happened during a Sukkoth festival. And so here is Haggai during yet another Sukkoth festival, talking about this temple, speaking with the people, saying, you know, I know some of you are saying that this temple ain't nothing like the old one. I know there's some of you here grieving the good old days. It's not as pretty. It's not as shiny. I know that. And in response, God is saying, take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord, work for I am with you. Work for I am with you. I I love that sentence so much. Take courage, I'm with you according to the promise that I made when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you. Do not fear, saith the Lord. It's chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And then we get to today's reading. Because in a little while, I'm going to shake things up. In a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth. In a little while, I will shake the nations so that the treasure of all the earth fills this house with splendor. And the glory of that old temple will be nothing compared to the glory of the new one. And this new glory, it's not about opulence. It's not about wealth. It's not about excess. It's about peace. Handel didn't go on to the end of this chapter. If he had, we would have gotten this verse in Messiah. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord, for in this place I will give peace. I will bring shalom, saith the Lord of hosts. So God is going to shake everything up, heavens, earth, sea, dry land, for a purpose, and that purpose is peace. That purpose is shalom. Here are the people looking at their pathetic excuse for a temple, feeling oh so bad about it, and God sends Haggai to say, it's all right. Here's a word of consolation from the Lord. What is coming 
is shalom. Reverend Dr. Will DeGaffney says, there is so much more in this word of consolation. God is satisfied with their best efforts. Who? how wonderful is it to hear that God is satisfied with our best efforts. She goes on, God has not compared their labor with that of their ancestors and found it lacking. God knows they're feeling insecure about the temple that they have recreated. And perhaps more importantly, God wants them to know that God is with them, temple or no temple. Haggai says that God is shaking things up and doing so for a reason, to bring shalom to the temple, to bring peace, but more than just the absence of conflict, shalom here means wholeness, completeness, fulfillment, the flourishing of all people, indeed of all creation. And sometimes to get there, things need to be shaken up a little bit, or if you prefer, shaken off. I mean, player's gonna play. <laughs> Hater's gonna hate, hate, hate. I know the Swifties in the room today. I can tell which ones of you laughed at that and which ones you're looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm I'm just going to shake, 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 shake. (laughs) God is shaking it off, shaking it up to bring peace. And how does that connect here? We're connecting this to Malachi, right? Malachi, as it turns out, is saying the same thing but using a different metaphor. Instead of shaking it off, shaking it up, Malachi is using the metaphor of refinement and refining fire that purifies silver. So Malachi is also uh, operating in the same time period, just a few years after Haggai, maybe 15 to 20 years after Haggai is operating. We don't know much about Malachi, but we do know that Malachi's name means my messenger. And so when we get to the reading from today and we hear that Uh, The messenger of the Lord will come into the temple. This messenger will arrive, and and at the arrival of this messenger, uh, a very powerful and very evocative question will be asked. When this messenger arrives, we get the question, but who may abide the day of his coming? Whoa. I mean, Handel sets that to such a beautiful melody for such a disturbing question like the messenger is going to arrive but who can endure it who's going to stand who can abide because he is like a refiner's fire for he is like a refiner's fire that will purify like silver gets purified and this is an intense process involving incredible amounts of heat to to, to purify away the imperfections. This is good news for us, right? That the messenger of the Lord is gonna come and, 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 and rid us of our imperfections so that we can be pure and why? Why? So that they may offer unto God an offering in righteousness. In righteousness. We're going to hear that in a little bit, as a matter of fact. Princeton Theological Seminary's Dr. Ann Stewart says of this passage, while we can affirm that the coming of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, is good news of great joy for all people, this does not mean that Christ's presence demands nothing of us. Anyone need me to hit that one again? The coming of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, is good news of great joy for all people. This does not mean that Christ's presence demands nothing of us or leaves us unchanged. She goes on to say, the good news is indeed that we will not be left unchanged, but will be reformed and refined to become like Christ. C.S. Lewis has said, if anyone wants a religion that makes them comfortable, Christianity is certainly not that religion. We are to be refined to become like Christ. How many disciples of Jesus want to compare themselves to other disciples of Jesus to see how good I'm following Jesus? I just need to look at how well my neighbor's doing it and just get a little bit better than that person. Ridiculous. Why would we compare ourselves to other people's discipleship when we're supposed to be comparing ourselves to Christ and becoming like him? 
And in order to do that, something's going to have to change. Some impurities are going to get refined away so that we can offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, before I go further, I should say, we can take this idea too far. Here's what I mean. Some people believe that every single challenging thing that happens to us happens for a reason. That every single, every single thing that's difficult or everything that makes us suffer is given to us by God for the purpose of purifying us. The rationale here is this horrible thing that is happening to me is just God shaking me up so that I can become a better person. Everything happens for a reason. I just need to figure out what that reason is. Let me be clear to you. Your pastor does not believe that. In no way, shape, or form do I believe that. I believe that sometimes bad things just happen. And I do believe that the grace of God flows somehow or other in everything, bad, good, and otherwise. God doesn't cause these horrible things to happen to us to purify us. Not everything that happens to us has a reason But God is there in the midst of everything that is happening, offering grace and peace and love, offering to change us, to transform us, to make us better than we are. All right, so we've got Haggai shaking us up. We've got Malachi refining us like silver. And Handel shakes us all up by putting those two things together for good reason. Because he's not trying to entertain. He is trying to transform In his work, he is trying to make us better. He is trying to to inspire our response to God's work in our midst. The coming of Christ is not going to leave us unchanged. And that is the good news of the gospel, that love changes us, that grace changes us. What we do as the church, our metaphorical building of the temple, we don't do that so that God will be with us. We know God is with us and has changed us, has purified us, so now we do what we do as the church. We are purified so that we can offer God's love and grace to the world around us. We are purified so we can embody God's love and grace in everything we do, in everything we say, in how we structure ourselves, in our relationships together. That is the offering in righteousness that we offer to the Lord our God. Not everything happens for a reason, but God's grace is present in everything, and God never lets anything go to waste. I don't know how many of you have seen the image of uh, a nativity uh, scene in a Lutheran church in Bethlehem, in the occupied West Bank, uh, in Palestine. Bethlehem's not... As you know, Bethlehem, if you've been there, you have to go through the checkpoint from Israel to get into Bethlehem. It's uh, intense. But this year, this Lutheran church in Bethlehem uh, has set up their nativity for the season. And they uh, just put a pile of rubble and debris in a corner of their building. And then they set the figures of the nativity around in that pile of rubble and debris and placed that baby Jesus in the center of that pile of rubble. Uh, Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac, the church's pastor, he got together with church members and, and decided to, to do it that way. And he said this, here, we wanted to say that it is as if they are looking for Jesus in the midst of the rubble. Here in Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus, where Christmas originated, this is what Christmas looks like to us. A light of hope and life coming out of destruction. Life coming out of death. A new temple being constructed because God is with us. A 
a new offering being offered because we have been purified, a new message of love and grace offered unto the Lord. In this Advent season, in the midst of debris and rubble, both physical and metaphorical, may we listen well to the words of the prophets, the prophet Haggai, who says to us, be strong, all ye people, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. The words of Malachi, who assures us that God shall purify the church, that we might offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. For God's promise for us this day is that the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. For in this place I will bring peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, purify us that we might offer unto you an offering in righteousness. God, we are grateful for your love and grace and the good news that your arrival in our midst does not leave us unchanged. Transform us that we might be the church that you are calling us to be, reflecting your love and light into the world in the name of Jesus, guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. Amen.